Welcome back to Round of the Bases, Extra Innings with Joel Block. I'm Joel Goldberg. Hope you listen to the audio version of the podcast. If not, if you just happen to be checking us out on YouTube, go on back and listen to it. A really good half hour's worth of great insight uh, and, and, and really, really cool stories here. Let, let's go to my world of baseball because I know you are a diehard baseball guy. How diehard of a Dodgers fan are you? Well, you know, I... <laughs> I'm I'm less of a diehard Dodger fan than I am a baseball fan. I, I love the Dodgers. I've been with the Dodgers my whole life. I mean, that's my my team. But I'm not a stats guy. I'm I'm not a you know I'm not a watch the trades. But I just I just really enjoy going to the ballpark. I've been a season ticket holder for twenty uh, something years, and we have a group of guys that uh, we share tickets. And you know, it's just it's been a really nice deal. And th- these are great seats, and I really enjoy going to the ballpark and uh, really being outside and. You know, you get to know the people who are around you because we see the same people over and over again. And it's it's just been an awesome uh, thing. And I, I just I love Dodger Stadium. It's one of the great places in my life. All right. So we're rounding the bases with Joel Block. That was the first question. The second out of the four. We'll stick with the the Dodger theme because, you know, one of the things I love every stadium that we go to, they're all unique. That's one of the, the beauties to me of baseball. They all have different dimensions. They have different looks. They have different feels. Some are packed. Some aren't packed. But they're characters in every single stadium. Sometimes it's the usher. Sometimes it's the vendor. Sometimes it's that fan that just loves to to be. We talked about disruption, to, to be that disruptor. By the way, I saw it the other night at a game I was doing in Cleveland before we were recording this. I think the, the bulk of people that are trying to harass the fans, I don't know if they even know this or not. They're not trying. To, they're not really harassing the fans. They're just trying to put on a show for whoever's listening to them because the players don't even hear it. But right? I was watching a guy just all over a player the other night. I'm like, can't even hear you at the plate but you feel like it's like night at the improv and it's not even that funny but point being they're just great characters when you go to a baseball game i think the pace of play well that's a whole nother story too we need to pick that up but just the the the, the pace of play in general in baseball affords for you to have some of those little side shows going on so you have a a a pretty good story in terms of a, a pretty famous peanut vendor at dodger stadium tell me that you know, I don't know if you guys all know uh, nation, nationally who uh, who Roger Owens is, but Roger, is, uh, he's the famous peanut vendor at Dodger Stadium. He's been on Johnny Carson. You know, the Dodgers doing, they kind of did like a, a PR stunt, you know, like in the 70s or something. He's been with the team since like the 50s. The guy's like, I don't know, 75. He's got to be pushing 80 years old. And he still runs up and down the stairs. And the guy is masterful. He throws peanuts. He say, hey, Rog, I'll take a bag of peanuts. And he throws the peanuts. Uh, and he'll throw them 25 rows away, uh, under the leg, behind the back, over the head, uh, around the corner, and he never misses. I mean, he's you know sometimes people pay more attention to him than the pitcher on the on the field, you know. And actually, I had Raj on my podcast. I know Raj for 25 years, and I, I invited him to a party through peanuts at a party I had one time, and and he just he's he's done a lot of fun things, and I see him at the ballpark all the time, and so I invited him onto my podcast, and he's not a technology person, he didn't even really know what that meant. But I, I really wanted to capture some of his great stories, you know, while he's here because we, we just lost Vince and, you know, some of these great characters, uh, I just want to capture them. And Rod tells me the story, he says that he has, he holds the record for holding the longest pitch on opening day. I said, well, what, what does that mean? He said he was on the second deck at Dodger Stadium and he threw a bag of peanuts to home plate from uh, the second deck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, listen. It's fun, but I'll tell you, you know, talk about the the, the world we live in. Uh, the uh, restaurant company that he works for that that you know sends him to Dodger Stadium every uh, every day uh, has just banned him from throwing peanuts after sixty three years because it's too dangerous and it could hurt someone. Yeah. So now uh, he can't throw peanuts anymore, and you know, there's no cash. It's it's, it's credit cards. It's the the world has changed, and some of it isn't so fun. No, it's not. Certainly not for older guys like us that, uh, that that love those moments. And it'll, I suspect it'll evolve into something else. It always does. And, and hopefully whatever that something else is involves Roger because you, you have institutions like that, that people really have grown up with. I mean, it, people, you know, people I love going to the ballpark to yeah. see the players, to see the stadium, to see Raj. I mean, they just, they go and they just enjoy a lot yeah. of different parts of uh, the experience. 
And I think that's what makes baseball so unique. They're, they're great experiences, by the way. I mean, I've covered all the sports. I've been all baseball pretty much for years now. But there, there are unique elements to all of them, you know, to, to hockey, to basketball, to football, to the college landscape, to soccer, all of it. But there's just, at least for me, there's something different about baseball. And maybe it's just the America's pastime. They're behind, by the way. I mean, I, this isn't meant to prop them up above. They, they are so behind in the way they promote their athletes and their superstars the way that the NFL and, and Major League Baseball, or pardon me, uh, uh, NBA do such a better job. That's a whole different story. But I think as long as this game has been around, characters like Roger have have helped add to the greatness of the game. It, it adds sense. a lot of color. No question. No question. Okay, third question as we round the bases. Let's, let's get back uh, to your podcast a little bit. I'm, I'm guessing that you've had a lot of interesting, cool characters like Roger uh, on that podcast. Have you had some favorites? You know, I, I love having athletes because athletes uh, have a unique perspective about teamwork, about culture, uh, you know, and I think CEOs can learn uh, enormous, enormous things from them. I also, though, uh, like to have some of these CEOs that have been through complicated experiences because CEOs, you know, human beings learn from each other. That's what we do. Uh, it it, it kind of confuses me, this whole cultural appropriation problem that we have in the world. That's That's how human beings do things, is that we borrow from each other. So I'm not really sure what that's about. But, you know, listen... Part of why companies bring guys like you and me in uh, is because executives want to learn from what we've learned. And in my career, I've made some mistakes. I've done some things well. I, some things didn't go that, uh, my way. They want to learn about those things and they want to be exposed to those things because it shortens their learning curve. Uh, it's, it's different than going to Harvard and reading it out of a book when people like us share ideas. So, uh, you know, we have had some interesting people. Uh, there have been some CEOs that took their companies public too early, that thought something was going to happen that didn't happen. And when they share those ideas, uh, everybody benefits. And so there's been uh, you know a lot. In fact, actually, one of my one of my dear friends, Mark Eaton, who was the uh, mm. center for the Utah Jazz, seven foot four, died last year uh, uh, unexpectedly in a, in a bicycle accident. Uh, very dear friend of mine. He was on the show and he talked about how. Uh, you know, really uh, teamwork works. He had, the, he had the four core principles that he learned in his career. Uh, another sports star, uh, Carl Mecklenburg, who's a big, big star here in Denver. Uh, he's, a, he's a really a very nice friend of mine, really a, a very, very famous athlete here. And, and he just, he looks at the world. Uh, you know, Carl is not a typical athlete where uh, he, he's not stuffy. If you ask him for an autograph, he, he, he feels flattered that you asked him. I mean, he, he's such a gentleman. And I, I, I really think a lot of these young athletes could learn something from him because you got to remember that athletes are, are entertainers. They're not paid for athletics. They're paid for entertainment. And the reason they make a lot of money is like Tom Cruise doing a movie. Uh, why do they get so much? You know what? They get a dollar a person per game. If you think about it, every one, every one of us gives them a dollar. And every time we watch them, that adds up to $50 million in a year. That's how they make their money. They get a dollar from each of us. And think about that when you're putting your living together. You know, can, you, can you get people to give you $20 or $50 or $100? Uh, or can you get a lot of people to give you only just $1? And that's how athletes make their money. And, you know, some of these guys do a really, really good job of it. So these are the kind of guys we have on the show. And, and I just love their perspective. Well said, and I'll encourage everybody to check out the podcast, Profit from the Inside. My last question, the walk-off, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up with some blackjack. I, I think we all love the, the movies, whether it's blackjack or whether it's, you know, any of the Ocean's Eleven type of movies or casino or on and on. They're just, they take us to places that may or may not be exactly true, but it's romanticized. It can be exaggerated. The same reason we like the mob movies and all that type of stuff. So two-part question. One, how realistic are some of those blockbusters? And two, who plays Joel Block in the movie? <laughs> I don't think I have an answer to the second one. You know, the <laughs> second question, I, I really haven't got any idea. But uh, how realistic are these? 
you know, blackjack is real. I mean, there are people who can beat this game. There are people who understand it that can out that can outpace the casino. I mean, it's a hundred percent true. Uh, does it exactly happen the way that it's dramatized? You know, listen, think think about a golf movie. You know, the putt goes in just perfect. You know, from from a half a mile away, uh, the, 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 the an air ball drops into the cup. I mean, I mean, you know, listen, that's the movies, and that's that's kind of how it works. And cameras can do all kind of crazy things, but uh, there is some reality. Uh, these things are, if they're based on reality, then they're uh, they're based in fact. Uh, whether they dramatize them, I think that if you watch, here's the thing that people don't understand: is you might lose sixty percent of the hands, but the forty percent that you win uh, is when the big money's pushed up. Because I know when the cards are likely to favor my position, and that's when I'll bet the big money. So I tend to win more of the hands when the money's up front, even though I may actually lose sixty or sixty-five percent of all the hands in aggregate. So you're watching going, I don't really get how you win, but it's not about a 50-50 kind of arrangement because I bet small when I think I'm probably not going to do well, and I bet a lot. And the trick in life and business is to know when are you likely to win. If you know when you're likely to win, that's when you're going to push the majority of your chips up to the front of the table. And that's really what we have to learn in life is we have to learn when we push the chips to the front. That's pretty much it. and and. As you said on the audio portion of the podcast, recognizing the trends, right? I mean, now I'm not betting on the results of baseball. I don't think I'm on disallowed to do. I just don't do it. Um, everybody's betting on everything nowadays. But you know how I generally know when a guy's going to start hitting because I'm looking at some of the data and the exit velocity. When I do my scorecard, people say, "You keep score. Why do you keep score?" I'm like, "Well, that's how I do my post game show." Uh, uh, I'm not a scripted guy, but you never know what might matter. And so that line out to left field, that 0 for 4 by a player, yeah, all 0 for 4s are created equal, but if all those 0 fers were scalding the ball, then he's seeing it, well, there's a pretty good chance he's about to get hot. If you're paying attention to the information, don't you have a better chance of having an idea of what's going to happen? Well, I would imagine a couple of things. One is scorekeeping for you forces you to pay attention. Yeah. So it's kind of a mechanism that you use that just keeps you uh, in the game as opposed to just randomly looking. The other thing is that baseball is a game of momentum and there's a lot of mental to this. You know, you can go 0 for 4, but if you've got a really good, uh, you know, something happen, all of a sudden, you know, what, what is a hot streak? A hot streak is a guy believes he's hot. I mean, he believes that something great's about to happen. Like, damn, I did fantastic the last time. Yeah. And I know I got it in me to do it again. Um, you know, and they always talk about, you know, that a, uh, a bad memory is your best, your best friend. You know, you got to forget what you did yesterday. Yeah. And that's kind of what they talk about with golfers and baseball players and everybody else. But the truth is that we do remember and we do take uh, last time with us into next time. And when you do great uh, last time, uh, you know, it encourages you to do great next time. And it's really hard to break the cycle, but if you can break the cycle, off you go. Amen to all of that. You're speaking my language. I want to remind everybody, if you haven't checked out the audio version of the podcast, please do so. Uh, wherever you get your podcast, Spotify, Apple, you know the drill, Rounding the Bases with Joel Goldberg. You can also learn more about Joel Block at joelblock.com. Shoot, you can learn more about Joel Goldberg, too, at joelgoldbergmedia.com. Either way, uh, we got a couple of guys that are also speakers, both who love baseball, one who's a much better blackjack player than the other, although I do enjoy the game, but I just never was able to dig in as deep as you were. But most importantly, it's been really insightful, a lot of fun. Um, glad to be able to meet you. Thanks for all that you do as well with National Speakers Association. Looking forward to hearing about the speech in Kansas City, wishing that I would be able to be there. But Joel, thanks so much for spending all the time. Happy to be here.